Can you just jump right into Smart IO Mux and show us uh, what we've all been missing or all the time we've potentially been wasting doing it the old fashioned way? Absolutely. Let me pull that up and show you a few things. Hey guys, welcome to Embedded Toolbox, the video interview series where we try to save the world by solving one engineering challenge at a time. And today we're gonna to be addressing a challenge that's particularly relevant to all those embedded engineers out there, which is pin muxing. So pin multiplexing is something that um, engineers the world over are increasingly leveraging as SOCs get more complex. And to help us broach that challenge, we brought on Andreas Burkhardt, who is the Senior Product Manager for DigiConnect Core at Digi International. How are you today, Andreas? Thanks, Brandon. Doing fine. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Um, so you heard it, uh, pin muxing today. Uh, that's something that most embedded developers and electronics engineers should be familiar with, or or should they? How you know how common is it today to to use pin mu pin muxing in a design, and uh, you know where do you see it being used most? Like what are the application types? Modern embedded processors, also called system on chip or SOCs, host a big selection of features and interfaces, but not all the features can be used at once. The system on chip or the system on module using that SOC has a limited number of pins and not every pin can take every function. So processor pins usually have their primary main function and about three or four or sometimes even seven alternate functions. And the embedded designer needs to map the complete set of interfaces required in their product to the available SOC or module pins with their respective four, five, or seven interface options. This can be a complex task, especially when you need a lot of different interfaces in your final product. For example, uh, if you occupy a few pins that can take, for example, the ethernet functionality with something else, and you later try to map the ethernet interface, you would not have any pins available anymore that can take that ethernet function. So you would have to free up those pins again and move the interface that was using them to different pins and you start moving things around and it's difficult to find the right order for assignments in order to find that working configuration for your system. So yeah, that does sound uh, pretty complex, and especially the you know the the more complex the SOC, the more com uh, complex pin muxing becomes. What traditionally would be the process to go through um, if you were trying to change the functionality of uh, you know a given pin or or, or pins um, in your design? For new and better processes, manufacturers like NXP or providers of system on modules using that embedded processor often only provide Excel-based spreadsheets for the different pin functions and their alternate functions uh, these pins can take. Um, so let me, let me show you a quick example of how, how those uh, sheets can look like. This is what a, a typical spreadsheet like this would look like. You get the, the pin names and then all the alternate functions. And it's that big list of uh, pins and, and their functionality. You need to crawl through and find the right ones for your design. Uh, and then also you need to map all your interfaces you require on, on all those pins. It's not so easy for many developers to get this right. Often when you power up your prototype, you realize that some interface might not work. And when you debug and review things, you might find some wrongly connected pin and the pin you actually connected might not be able to serve that function you require. If you're lucky, it's just not configured correctly in software and you can fix it in the software configuration files, but you need to debug that all and find the error causing the issue. What happens on the software side? I mean, I can see that this gets could get really complex inside of the stack um, if you don't do it correctly. Correct. Once the hardware connection is made, you also need to configure all the pins and software for the function they should take, but also for their electrical characteristics like the drive strengths or if they're working in pull up or pull down mode. In Linux and in Android, this is done with a kernel configuration file called the device tree. The device tree configures the kernel for your hardware design you're running it on. Creating that device tree configuration file for your specific hardware is not trivial. And if you only get one value wrong or one bit in the, in the configuration file, your interface simply doesn't work and you need more debugging. Now, you, now you're dealing with increasing complexity in multiple parts of your design, right? Not only on the hardware side, but also within the device tree and the configuration files, which can get messy really quickly. Um, so what 
out there, um, is there an alternative? I know Digi International uh, works a lot with embedded SOMs. And so this is something that you and your engineering team have vast experience with. Uh, embedded designs used to be based on microcontrollers with just a few simple interfaces like UERTs and, and ADCs. And over the years, they evolved into complex SOCs with more pins and more functions. And IMX 8X processor, for example, uh, NXP is providing, has more than 300 pins and a good portion of these are configurable IO pins. Uh, this provides hundreds of different configuration options and every IO pin you use needs to be configured in that device tree I mentioned with hex values for register settings to set it up in the way uh, you need it for your design. So there's quite a bit of configuration code to write as well. And Digi is providing a tool called Digi Smart IO Max, which removes that complexity. Uh, the complexity is taken away from the designer uh, and uh, device tree gets generated automatically on uh, based on the interfaces you have assigned uh, in your project and that enables the designer to clearly focus on on more of their core competencies and adding value to their product rather than this embedded design complexity that's very good um can you just jump right into smart iomux and show us uh, what we've all been missing or all the time time we've potentially been wasting doing it the old-fashioned way absolutely let me pull that up and show you a few things for this example, we go with the LGA pad layout. I can either start from an empty design and I add my interfaces as required to the design, or I can start from an existing template, for example, to connect Core 6CL SPC Pro reference board. Let me select the template and finish. The design opens and I can see all the configured interfaces in my design. I can see there's 10 out of 245 free pads uh, available to add additional interfaces. So let's start modifying the design. On the left, I see all the interfaces which are mapped to the SOM pinout currently. Let's assume I don't need an LCD interface, so I can remove this and also the PWM for controlling the backlight. So let's remove the PWM and then the LCD interface. Let's remove a few of the GPIOs going to the reference board expansion header. And I see the free pads number gets higher, 37 out of 245 right now. So now I can start adding things into my uh, design. For example, if I would like to add an additional I square C port, uh, I go to add new component and I see the available components. Uh, for example, three remaining I square C buses to be mapped uh, for my um, carrier board. So selecting I square C, click finish, brings up a dialog for additional configuration of the I2C interface. Um, here I get presented with information that I need to define the SCL and SDA lines uh, in my design and brings up that snippet of the device tree pointing me to the location where I would have to make those um, modifications to assign the right GPIOs to provide SCL and S SDA lines. Further, I get a section uh, for the actual I2C peripherals uh, and the tool tells me that I need to configure that afterwards to support my I2C peripheral. So I click OK and I find my new interface on the left here in the mix. Let's just add a, another thing here, for example, an additional UART port. Um, the tool tells me I have five remaining UARTs. Four of them come from the IMX processor, and we have one additional one, the fifth one, coming from the Digi Microcontroller Assist. An additional microcontroller Digi is providing on all SOM designs to provide additional functionality uh, and additional peripherals, uh, for example, that UART here. So I can add a new a UART, a new UART from the IMX processor, and I select the number of lines, uh, and I can finish, and I find my UART uh, in the design uh, on the left here. Another nice feature uh, is the device tree uh, snippets, device tree help. 
The device tree is the configuration file for the Linux kernel representing your exact design with all the interfaces and electrical pad configurations. So for every interface in my design I can pull up the device tree hint uh, providing the definition in the device tree for that interface. For example, Ethernet I see here I have my uh, FEC1 uh, and then the IO Max configuration for the pads providing Ethernet 1. Or for the UART, the one we have just added, I get the device tree, this is UART number 4, uh, it enables the UART and the configuration uh, and I have the IO Max pad settings uh, down here in that section. Let me show a few more things on how you can work with the interfaces. My I2C interface, for example, I see uh, this is assigned to pad A10 and A18 now. Uh, if I want, I can lock the configuration so the tool is not modifying these when you add additional interfaces or remove interfaces and the tool automatically uh, rearranges things to find a working configuration. Uh, I can also switch that to other pads where that function is available if I prefer to have it on a, on a different pad. I can also select the individual pads and then change the electrical values of that pad. I see that hex number in here, that's the current configuration, and I can go and edit these uh, values. You can hover over the different fields and you get an explanation uh, on uh, what uh, they actually mean. For example, the drive strength field, that's you just the drive strengths, tells you the different options you have here uh, for configuring it, uh, and then you can change things by just clicking on the individual fields and it changes the total value to configure that complete pad. Quite convenient, uh, so you don't have to review the hardware reference manual of the i.mx processor and find all those uh, different options and hex values for the pad configuration and manually add that into your device tree. It's all done in a nice graphical way here with explanations embedded on the different options here. And last, you have a complete table view of your design, which you can export and provide to the hardware engineer to draw the actual schematics based on that configuration. And you can go back, get the device tree snippets, so you have your Linux kernel configuration uh, right out of this tool as well. Well, that's some good stuff there, Andreas. Um, now, it does raise the question, obviously, Digi International has a wide portfolio of SOMs, a system on modules. Um, but does Smart IO Mux help me beyond the system on module? Obviously, end products aren't just system on modules, right? So people are going to be wanting to add additional capabilities. And even within Digi International, you have a, a portfolio of add on modules, Digi XB, um, and others that can add additional functionality. So can Smart IO Mux be extended beyond your base SOM and out to add on boards and cards like that? Absolutely. You can uh, definitely uh, set up the system to talk to uh, externally connected peripherals. Uh, the process does not change. Those add-on modules and peripherals are connecting through specific interfaces. Uh, to use them in your design, you simply need to make sure you add this interface to your Smart IO Max project. Uh, for XP, as you brought that up, this will be a, a UART interface or SPI interface, which you simply need to uh, select from your available component list, as we have seen that before. Very good. Um, but, you know, I always have to ask this question, which is, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Uh, you know, what are what are we what are we giving up here? You know, does it cost some extra? You know, we, is there overhead in terms of memory or performance? You know, what's the what's the secret? What are we what are we actually paying for? Digi Smart IO Max is free and comes comes completely free with our Connect Core SOMs. It's free of charge, no extra cost. It actually helps you to reduce your project cost. With Smart IO Max, you ensure quality design from the start. It ensures your first prototype actually works. So you do not have to do that extra board spin of your prototype, which takes time and costs money. Um, on the memory side, there's no impact. What you do is you, you generate your configuration 
configuration files for the Linux kernel in an automated way rather than typing that uh, or figuring that out manually. So there's no, no impact on memory usage or, or any performance overhead. Smart IOMAX simply shortens your development and debug time and takes risk out of your projects. That's fantastic. Well, that's really good news uh, for all the uh, embedded engineers and electronics engineers out there who are probably a little bit tired of diving through a huge Excel sheets and uh, data sheets. Uh, but for more information, Andreas, on uh, Smart IOMUX and the rest of the Digi International line of embedded system on modules, where, where, can, where can people find out more? Uh, you should go to our website at www.digi.com and you will find links to our Smart IO Max tools and uh, also our full documentation on the embedded Connect Core SOMs in the product section. Um, I also encourage people to check out our embedded documentation portal. Uh, it's a very well structured, very well organized, uh, complete documentation portal, uh, highlighting all the features of the Digi SOMs, of the uh, extra Digi software we are providing all the development tools which come with the Connect Core uh, solution and Smart IO Max, of course. That's great. So that's, that's the place to go. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your insight today and uh, that great little demo there, Andreas. Hopefully it saves a bunch of people time. And for all you engineers out there, good luck muxing.